Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate you guys uh, uh, coming. Th we have an awesome, awesome speaker lined up. I'm personally Thank very you. excited. I'm a big fan of this guy, uh, James Altucher. Uh, he's a, a multiple uh, best-selling author. He's written books like Choose Yourself, Reinvent Yourself, uh, Trade Like Buffett. He's a serial entrepreneur, investor, VC. He's invested in over 20 companies. Uh, he's a, a prolific podcaster. Uh, he's interviewed people like Stephen Pressfield, Tony Robbins, uh, uh, to, to, to Rick Ross, who uh, you know uh, ran a big uh, drug empire in the 80s, so people from all walks of life. Uh, he's a, a crypto expert, but he likes to remind people that that's not all he's about. Uh, that is all the rage right now. Um, and he does have an awesome class on Masterclass you guys should check out. Um, and uh, if you guys want to learn more about him, go to jamesaltucher.com. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's start this interview. I really appreciate you coming here, James. Jesse, I can't tell you how much I'm appreciative of being invited here. So my favorite company in the world. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and you apparently have a, a pretty good story when it comes to, to Google, right? Well, well, so one time I started this company and I'm always in the mode, as soon as I start a company, I want to sell it, which is really kind of not a good philosophy to have. But unfortunately, that's my philosophy. And uh, so the instant the company started, I basically went around to every company, um, AOL, Yahoo, Google, Forbes, Interactive Corp. And it was kind of like a social media site for people interested in investing. And I basically said, we're for sale. And Google Finance was just starting at the time. I don't even know what, what's happening now with Google Finance, but Google Finance was uh, uh, starting at the time. And I met with them in New York. And it was great. Like, it was in this conference room where then it, goes, it went right into a video screen where the people in San Francisco were on the other side. So it felt like one big conference table. And I just remember walking into Google New York. And people were skateboarding around. There was like chefs making mm -hmm. lunch. There were people getting haircuts. There was like everybody, everybody had like three monitors or crazy monitors, and I just, I'm like, oh my gosh, I really want to be here. Like, I want to come to work here. I hadn't had a job in 12 years at that point, and I just really, like, wanted to just hang out there. And I remember waking up at 2 in the morning, and I had that feeling like you get when you're on your, your first high school date with a big crush, and I had this feeling like, oh my gosh, I, I love Google. And so I wrote... Uh, I think it was uh, Katie Jacob Stanton was running um, Google Finance at the time. She ended, up at, she ended up working for Obama, then working at Twitter. I don't know where she is now. Um, I wrote her and, and I said, I really love the meeting. I love Google. Let's, I can't wait to our next conversation. It's like everything you would write as like after your high school crush first date. I wrote in this email like, you know, like hours after I met them. And she never wrote back. I never heard from them again. <laughs> and, but which is typical also of that high school first date. By the way, I never had a first date in high school. I had a first date when I was in college, finally. But I'm imagining that's what it would be like if you had a first date in, in high school. So that's my Google story. <laughs> there you go. Well, anytime you want to come hang out, just, just let us know. All right, that's welcome. great. Um, so uh, I want to just get into your background a little bit, just for some context uh, for, for the people that don't know out there. And uh, you're very kind of vulnerable and open about the adversity you've faced uh, in your adult life. But take us back to you know the beginning. Give us give us like a, a bio. Give us everything. Sure. So uh, I'll I'll speed it speed through it. But I was a technologist at heart. I I majored in computer science. I went to graduate school of computer science. Um, in fact, the last time I was on this campus, I visited uh, uh, an ex-grad school classmate of mine, which was Astro Teller, who runs, uh, I don't know what it's called now, it was Google X then, I don't know what Google it's called. Google X Moonshots. Moonshots, I think it's yeah. yeah. So, Moonshots, uh, 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 and, then I, and then I got really interested in, in writing. I, I wrote uh, four failed novels, uh, which is, I don't know where they are now, they're thrown out somewhere. and. Uh, I decided I wanted to be in the entertainment industry, so I went to work for HBO in New York. And uh, from that, I was able to combine several interests at once. I knew technology. I knew how to build websites in the mid-'90s. No one else knew how to build them. So I, but I was also in the entertainment industry. So I started a company that focused on building 
uh, very particular niche sort of websites. You can probably even tell what kind of websites just by the way I look, but every, almost all of our websites were uh, uh, the websites of gangster rap record labels. So that's supposed to be a little bit funny. Um, but we did Bad Boy Records, Loud Records, The Source Magazine, Death Row Records, Jive Records, and um, AmericanExpress.com, which most people don't know is actually a gangster rap record label, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> TimeWarner.com. We did MirrorMax.com, uh, with where when Harvey Weinstein was running it. And we did um, Con Edison. It was funny. We did ConEdison.com's website, and then we made an internal website for them to keep track of their Y2K <laughs> stuff. And I remember asking them in one of the meetings, where are you guys going to be during, you know, on December 31st, 1999? And they were 100% of them was like, we're, we're going to be long, far away from New York City then, because they had no faith in their abilities to keep the electricity going on Y2K. But everything was fine, so they didn't know anything. But so I so I I started that that company. We grew pretty fast, and then during the boom of uh, you know everybody was acquiring and IPOing and so on. So we sold the company. I, was, I remember my my sister who was in like junior high school at the time was learning how to build websites at that point, and I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I charge HBO seventy five thousand dollars to do a three page website about Dennis Miller, and now my, my junior high school sister is learning how to build websites. So that this business is going down, this industry is going downhill. And within, probably within three or four years, every single business in that industry was bankrupt. And uh, so I sold that company and started a VC fund, started a, a hedge fund. Along the way, I went totally broke. So I sold this company, cashed out. It wasn't like I had paper cashed out for enough money for the next three generations of my kids, grandkids, great-grandkids could live. And then I managed to spend every single dime. <laughs> like, there was one summer, it was really, it was really unbelievable. And again, it wasn't like on paper. There was one summer I probably lost a million dollars a week. And then at the end of it, I go to my ATM machine, and I had $143 left in my bank account. So then I, 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 I lost all this money, and so I wrote some software to figure out why did I lose this money. I modeled, I, I did all sorts of statistical pattern modeling, pattern recognition on the stock market over the past 60 years, and started trading based on, on this software that I wrote. Built up a hedge fund, then a fund of hedge funds, then I built this kind of social media site for investing, uh, sold that, started another hedge fund after that. Um, and then gradually I started doing more and more angel investing because I realized I really couldn't handle day trading and, and hedge fund investing was so stressful for me in every way. I remember I would put on a trade and, and it would, the trade would instantly go against me sometimes even if like every software was shouting it, and I thought I could outsource my emotions to the software, but I would still get so stressed. Like I would, I would go across the street, there was a church across from my house, and I'd go across the street, no one would be in the church, and I would literally go right up to the statue of Jesus, and I would pray, please make S&P futures go up. I'll, <laughs> I'll do anything. And I'm Jewish, so I'm in the Catholic <laughs> church, just wouldn't work out. And, um, and so eventually I did a fund of hedge funds, but I, I decided to get out of the hedge fund space and I focused more on angel investing, which was, which was much easier, not easier, but much more relaxing for me. And then I, I, I had previously written a bunch of books in the finance space, but then suddenly I started writing about my, this was around 2010, I started writing about the things I was feeling vulnerable about and the things I was scared about. And, and I realized, look, this is much more important to people. Not everybody cares whether Apple is a better investment than Microsoft, uh, but everybody goes through periods in their life where they don't know what they're doing, they don't know what path they should be taking, they feel like maybe they've made some mistakes in their journey and they want to reinvent themselves. And so I became very interested on, because I had reinvented myself so many times, I became very interested in this process of reinventing myself, 
and, and getting rid of all the obstacles along the way. Like if you, if anybody were to decide, oh, I don't want to be a software engineer anymore. I don't want to be an accountant anymore. I want to be uh, an actor, or I want to be a writer, or I want to be, um, I want to be a doctor, or, or work in the healthcare business somehow. People will always, the first thing everyone will tell you is you can't do that. And because I saw it time after time, I probably reinvented my career 15 times, and that's conservative. And every single time, someone has said, usually the first person I spoke to, my mother, has said, you can't do this. <laughs> and, 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 and you have to figure out, well, how am I going to do this, both psychologically and mentally? How am I going to learn to do this? How am I going to be around the right people so that they influence me and, and I'm inspired by them? How do I stay healthy enough so I have the energy to do this? It takes a lot of energy to reinvent a career. How do I kind of spiritually avoid the anxiety of failure? If you try to, if you say to yourself, okay, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna um, work in a cubicle, I'm gonna be a professional skateboarder. Well, if you do that initially, you're gonna fail. Every day you're gonna fail at it. Um, because you're gonna realize, you're gonna, you're gonna love something enough that you're gonna realize, oh, the best people in the world do it this way, but I'm not that good yet, because you're gonna understand the difference between the best and yourself. So you have to get through the psychology of how do I keep improving, even though it's so hard and so painful to fail every single day. Uh, and just all these things, the, the process of reinvention, the pain of reinvention, the pain of success is, uh, is very psychological and requires a lot of energy and it requires a lot of, uh, a spirituality is the wrong word, but a way of dealing with the, the anxiety of, of trying to improve yourself at no matter what age you are. You know, we always think, oh, when I'm 18, that's when I'll put myself on the right path, because I'll study it in college, and then I'll be an expert, and then I'll succeed at what I studied in college. But what if at the age of 40, you decide you want to change? What if at the age of 60, you decide you want to change? And people change at every, you know, I don't know anybody who's done the same thing from the age of 20 to 60. And you have to be able to deal with all the ups and downs. Now, some people don't, and they decide they, they stay the same, and they get gradually that chronic level of anxiety that just builds into their system. And then every disease, basically, is related to that, like th that slow stress that you don't really notice but exists, as opposed to handling the volatility of, of trying to, to succeed at something that volatility eventually subsides and you succeed, but it's very, very difficult on that path. And so I became very interested in that. That's why I started the po podcast. That's why I wrote these books, Choose Yourself, Reinvent Yourself. And, and with Choose Yourself was a great example where I didn't want, I wanted to write a book that was a story that was for me. And I didn't want to deal with, and, I, and of course because I was, the book was called Choose Yourself. I wanted to figure out how do I choose myself with publishing this book. Here, if any of you have written a book or tried to write a book before, uh, it's very hard to get published. And, and, and the rewards of it are very small. So you have to get through, uh, when you submit your book to somebody, you have to get through an, an agent, you have to get through an editor's assistant, an editor has to say this is a great book, a marketing team for a publisher has to say this is a great book, this is a great book. The publisher has to say this is a great book. The publisher has a committee. They have to say it's a great book. Bookstores then have to say it's a great book. So all these steps along the way, you have to have all these people who are not qualified, really, to tell you your book is good or bad when you're the only one who's qualified to decide. So I decided to skip that with the book Choose Yourself, and I've done that ever since. And that, by the way, was my most successful book. It sold over a million copies. and. Uh, uh, you know, again, the benefits of not only doing what you love doing, but figuring out along the way how to avoid the obstacles that nobody else has even thought to avoid. Uh, Choose Yourself, I ended up self-publishing. I self-published it through another smaller company down the street called Amazon, or actually up the street very far, I should say. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, and again, with everything you do, there's ways to usually choose yourself to kind of avoid a lot of the obstacles and pitfalls that the gatekeepers will always try to put in your way, that you can't do this, people. Yeah. So in a, in a nutshell, that's, 
that's my background. I can talk about specific <laughs> hedge fund strategies, but that's not as, as interesting, or how to make a website or whatever, but that, that's not as interesting. How specific, and you were writing uh, uh, manuals for computer chips at one point, right? Yeah, a long time ago, in the, I, I, there was a company called Four Systems that uh, had the fastest chips out there, and I was writing their, their manuals, and I remember, uh, and I wanted to be a writer, and so I thought they, they hired me figuring, A, I knew computers, I knew hardware, I'll play around with their chips, I'd write so I wrote the initial software for their chips, um, and then I wrote the customer manuals, and they were, le they were so bad, because I was, you can't do something you're not interested in. And the CEO calls me in his office, and he literally said to me, don't you take any pride in your work? And like, what kind of response is that going to get? Like, am I going to suddenly realize, oh, you're right, I should take more pride in my work. I just immediately, I think, thought to myself, I'm like, I'm like nodding to him on his suggestions, but I'm thinking to myself, I have to quit this job as quickly as possible. And that's what I did, was, was quit. I quit and left for HBO. Uh, uh, oh no, I left, I, there was an intermediate job in between, but yeah. How, so how do you go from, from that, from like working a dead end job, not being inspired, uh, maybe having some kind of like learned helplessness around like trying things on the outside uh, to what you are now, which is an idea machine where you, you're trying things constantly. If you think of something, you do it. Uh, you're involved, you have your hand in you know, millions of different things. You're incredibly productive. How do you go from that uh, to where you are now and, and, and maybe focus on the incremental kind of small steps you took uh, yeah. in that dead end job to get where you are now? I mean, there's, there's a lot of different answers. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of skip ahead 20 years to answer it. At one point, uh, not quite 20 years, maybe 18, 17 years later, but at one point I was broke again, probably for the third time. I, I kept making a lot of money and then somehow figuring out the fastest way possible. It was like <laughs> it was like my life's goal to figure out the fastest way possible to lose millions of dollars each time. And so one time again I was broke and I was, I remember I was on a hammock. I had two houses on this nice piece of property and there was a hammock in between them and it was just pouring rain and I was and I realized, you know, I'm broke again. It's pouring rain. I there's the IRS had literally like stamped on the wall of the house like, you know, going to be seized any day now. And I'm on this hammock. I'm thinking, how could this happen to me again? Why is it happening to me again and again and again? And uh, I, I realized, well, on the way up, things were happening differently than on the way down. And it was what I talked about earlier. I had focused on, on the way up every time, I had focused really hard on physical health, which basically doesn't mean go to the gym every day, but it means eat well, move well, sleep well. Emotional health, which it means be around good people who will support you. One toxic person, will, you need 20, <laughs> You need 20 or 30 positive people in your life to counteract one toxic person in your life. And it's such an important rule. That ratio never changes. Creative health, which is do one creative thing a day, and spiritual health, as I referred to before. But the creative health, now I'm going to go back in time a few years. Um, so prior time, I had been broke. Uh, I decided, OK, I want to, I had never been in the hedge fund or finance space before. I'd, I had been in the internet space, I was a technologist, I had been in the creative space, I had shot TV shows, I had done a bunch of things, I had written books, um, but I wanted to be in the finance space, so that's when I wrote this software modeling, the stock markets, and I wrote to everybody in the business that was a hero of mine, and I said, can you meet me for a cup of coffee? I'll just take five minutes of your time, can you meet me for a cup of coffee? Uh, I got zero responses, I wrote to 50 people, I got zero <laughs> responses. Because it's not as if Warren Buffett is going to suddenly get my email and say, Gladys, hold all <laughs> meetings. <laughs> James Altucher is going to buy me a 60 cent cup of coffee downstairs. And I really need to meet this guy and let him pick my brain for five minutes, which is probably going to be more like an hour or two. Um, nobody ever says that. I don't know why I said Gladys was his secretary. It seemed like the sort of, if you thought Warren Buffett had a secretary, it's like Gladys or Bertha or something like that. <laughs> like, I don't know why I think that. I don't know why I think she's a woman. My, uh, I happen to know she's a woman now, but could have been a man, he had his secretary. But um, nobody responded. And so I figured, you know what? I need to get 
figure out, every time something goes wrong, it's not, the common denominator in all these, it's not like Warren Buffett or, or all these people were bad guys. I'm the common denominator in 50 people not responding to me. So what did I do wrong? And you have to think about it. And so, well, I was being totally selfish. His, all these, Bill Gates' time is, is more valuable than my time. He's, he's a better human being than me. So why should he give me five minutes of his time? He, and so I needed to, to start exercising what I call the idea muscle. Now, if you have a bicycle accident and you're in, in the hospital bed for two weeks, you need physical therapy to walk again. Your leg muscles will atrophy that quickly. So it's the same thing with the idea muscle. If you don't come up with ideas every single day and even bad ideas, you'll lose the ability to come up with good ideas. And so I started writing down 10 ideas a day just for myself. They could be ideas about businesses. They could be ideas about books I want to write. They could be just stupid ideas like, oh, here's 10 pieces of clothing I'm going to design. Like just, I don't know how to design clothes. Here's 10 pieces of clothing. So every day, I, to this day, I still come up with 10 ideas a day. And um, today, for instance, I'm, I'm an advisor on a, a TV show. I came up with 10 ideas for, for them. And uh, 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 yesterday, I had an idea, 10 things. To, and this is not even ideas for businesses. 10 things I value more than money. And I remember on the very first list of ideas I wrote, this is in 2002, I wrote um, 10 games I could teach people uh, to be great at in, 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 in just three or four easy tips. So the idea is I wanted to write a book, uh, How to Beat Your Friends and Family at Every Game in the Universe. Because when you go to Thanksgiving, you play your friend, you break, uh, after dinner, you break out the Monopoly board uh, or Scrabble and you want to beat all your friends and family and humiliate them completely. And why not? If you're going to beat them, you might as well humiliate them. And, uh, and so I wrote down 10 ideas of games. And then for each game, the three or four ideas on how to win in that game. And then now suddenly I had an idea for a book that I could easily write, which I never did. Most ideas are bad. But like, take a game like Monopoly. What's the one thing you need to do to, to beat all your friends and family at Monopoly. It's just one tip, and you'll beat everyone at Monopoly. Anybody know? Hmm? Build hotels? Build hotels is not correct. <laughs> Persuade them to keep investing. Persuade them? OK, if you're a good negotiator. But there's one set of properties. I'll give you a hint. There's one set of properties that are far more valuable than any other set of properties by a factor of like five. So Park and, and Broadway, you're saying? Park Place and Broadway? That is the most valuable pieces, but uh, squares, but it's not the most important to own. In fact, those are the, the worst to own, I'm sorry to say. Um, no, I'll tell you now. <laughs> Nobody got it. The Orange Properties, say New York Ave, St. James Place, and Tennessee. And I'll tell you why. The most popular square to land on in Monopoly is jail, because there's three ways to land on jail. You either land on the go-to-jail square, the dice take you to jail, or the community chest has a card, go to jail immediately. So there's three ways to land on jail. It's the most popular square on the board. The most popular roll with the dice is a seven. Seven takes you to the utility right in the middle of the orange squares. So you're most likely to land on the orange squares. So someone else should own, you should own the orange squares and then build hotels on just the orange squares, and then you'll win. Bam, that's Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> After the talk, I can answer about any other game, but <laughs> Monopoly is the easiest to understand. So, I so, so then I started writing 10 ideas for these other people. So I wrote 20 emails, or I really researched each person. I said, here's 10 ideas for your business. Ten, I didn't ask for a cup of coffee. I didn't ask for anything. With one guy, I wrote, here's 10 ideas. He was a, a, a well-known writer, still is. Uh, 10 ideas, articles about investing you should write. With another person, big hedge fund manager, I said, here's 10 pieces of software that you could use. I, I, we have a very similar stylistic uh, way of investing. Here's 10 pieces of software for you. For I'll even teach your employees how to use this software. They work. Here's the tr my personal track record with them. You could have them. And another person, I wrote 10 ideas for him. Uh, and out of those 20, three people responded. You still get a very low response rate, but you're, but you're giving now instead of trying to take. Ideas are all about giving. 
You always want to help people with each idea. So the, the writer said, these are great ideas. Why don't you write them for us? So I started writing for his website. It was Jim Kramer. We started writing for, the, for his website, the, uh, thestreet.com. And, and then I got a book deal based on what I was writing, because it was very uh, different type of stuff. And, that, and I wrote you know, seven or eight books about investing after that. And I've been on CNBC a, a billion times. Jim Kramer's about to come on my podcast again. So you build a relationship over, over decades. Another person who responded was a, this big hedge fund manager. He invited me over for uh, lunch. We got to know each other. And he ended up personally investing money with me. And then I started my hedge fund. And then the third person who responded said, yeah, sure, I'll have, let's have lunch and talk about these ideas. I never responded to him. 12 years later, I hit reply on that exact same email. <laughs> and I said, hey, can you come on my podcast instead of lunch? This is 2014. I hit reply on that email instead of, 20, instead of 2002. He responded and said, sure. It's the only podcast he's ever been on, Nassim Taleb, who wrote Fooled by Randomness, <laughs> Black Swan, Anti-Fragile. Uh, and now he's coming. When's he coming to my podcast again? In February. So, so he's never, never been on any other podcast. So that's, that's another thing I typically do is I'll go through my emails from 10 years ago. And I have 280,000 unread emails. So I'll hit reply. On, on an email from 2007 <laughs> and just answer as if I got the email yesterday. And <laughs> no one has ever not responded to that way of getting back in touch. You know how sometimes you don't get back in touch with someone and you feel really bad about it? Wait 10 years and then reply. <laughs> Life hack number 867. So, uh, so this, this idea stuff, I haven't stopped doing it since 2002. Every single day I'll write down 10 ideas. Uh, but then sometimes people say, sorry if I'm answering very long here. No, it's great. But, but you asked about the micro steps you take. Sometimes uh, people say, oh, ideas are a dime a dozen. Execution's everything. People don't realize execution is a subset. Execution ideas are a subset of actual ideas. So I'll give an example that involves <laughs> Google and, and particularly Android. I, I, I was at a, a, a birthday dinner, and a friend of mine was there with his brand new girlfriend. And I said, oh, you guys look really cute together. And they said, oh, we just had the conversation. We're going steady now. And I'm like, do people still say that, going steady? <laughs> like, is that a phrase? And, and he said, yeah, we even deleted our dating apps. So I had an idea the next day on my, I did a, a 10 app ideas. And one of the ideas was, let's make a going steady app. And a going steady app would, where you agree, you download the Going Steady app, you, both, you link to each other, you both say we're going steady, and it deletes all the <laughs> dating apps on both phones. And it keeps track of all the dating apps out there, just in case there are new ones. And if the other side ever let, downloads a dating app or does anything tricky, we'd figure it all out, the other person gets informed. And so I wrote down what's the 10 execute. So then the next day, I wrote here's the 10 ex for mini execution steps. It's not like, oh, uh, uh, how will I raise VC funding for this app? That's the stupidest thing of all. You don't, you don't think of a ways to help people and then immediately say, give me money to help people. You need to show that you're <coughs> a qualified and good person to, to help people. So I thought, what are the 10 next steps in execution that I can do to create this app? So I went on freelance.com and I spec'd out the whole app. So, so first, I spec'd out the whole app, actually. I said, this is what the front screen looks like. This is what the, the sub-screens look like. Here's how you log on. Here's how two people connect to each other. Here's how two people message each other. Here's the list of apps I want to watch out for. Um, and then I spec'd it out and on freelance.com. I got 10 companies from US, India, and Malaysia, the, the, the big three, as we call them. And uh, uh, that was a joke. <laughs> but, uh, 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 and everybody said, oh, we'll do it for $1,000 or $2,000 or $500. And then I, I called up each one, and I said, the one question I have that I don't know and I can't figure it out with my research, the one question I have wa is, can Android and iOS from within an app find the other app, see what other apps are on the phone? It turns out Android, yes, iOS, no. And since uh, many, you know, I, I didn't want to just do it for one operating system, I didn't do that idea, even though I'm absolutely sure it would have been a, 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 a huge hit. 
But, uh, <laughs> but here's a case where I had the idea, I had the execution ideas, I executed them. They were all, it took me two, three hours, two hours from beginning to end to figure out, to, to, to spec out the site, the, the app, talk to, ad advertise it, to actually find developers, call them, figure out what my main question was, ask them, and determine it was not a good, a good enough idea. So execution is not as hard as people think, but you still have to be good at idea generation to be good at execution idea generation so you know what those micro execution steps are. Now, if anyone could help me figure out how to do from within an iOS app to see the other iOS apps, we're in business. So, <laughs> um, but that's kind of an example of you know, ideas can lead to execution. They're not separate. It's not that execution is everything, ideas are nothing. Mm. They're, they're, they're interwoven and connected. Yeah. So that was my huge response to that question. That's a great answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you've had these kind of wild financial swings that you just described in your life, um, and it, it's uh, been kind of a, a volatile uh, path for you. How has that uh, changed your philosophy, and how have things like minimalism and stoicism and kind of non-attachment to material things and money kind of informed the way you think now? Yeah, so, so uh, I mean, it's really, I see, I see what I call um, failure porn all over the internet now. Like, oh, I failed, so my next thing will be a success. Oh, I failed, here's 10 things I learned. That sort of tells me that they didn't quite fail, because failure is really insanely painful and difficult. You know, some failures more than others. But, um, and it's really unpleasant. Like, it's an unpleasant feeling in your stomach. You feel like, you know, just because you hit rock bottom doesn't mean you're, you're, you're not gonna go even lower. Most people I know who, who say, well, I hit bottom here, and then if I drill, like on my podcast, people say, I hit rock bottom here. And I'm like, really? Well, what happened, where were you six months <laughs> later? And they were like, well, then I was, in the street with a needle out of my elbow. Well, okay, that sounds like more like rock bottom <laughs> to me. Um, and uh, uh, so it's really, it's really painful, but I think that's what really focused me on, at the end of the day, I really, I re and I say this to my daughters too, A, I ask them to ask themselves, who have I helped today? Because if you've helped, that means you have some energy, that, uh, and that means you have ideas and so on, but really, I, I, I make sure I check the list every day, physical health, emotional health, creative or idea health, and spiritual health. And the spiritual health, again, can I deal with the inevitable things that I can't control? Like, oh, this business failed, you know, it's over. I mean, there was one day, can I tell a story again? Do we have time? Can yeah, yeah, go for so it. So there's one day, I was on the set of a TV show. Some friends of mine had created this TV show, and uh, they invited me to, to watch the, the pilot being filmed. And like one of my favorite directors was filming the pilot. Some of my favorite actors were in the show. Having the best day. I was on the board of a company and my shares in this company were worth millions of dollars. And I get this message in the middle of the day, emergency board meeting. And I'm thinking, great, the company got sold. I'm gonna finally cash in on these shares and I'm gonna, it's gonna be great. And um, I get on the board and, I mean, I get on the call and it was announced right away, well, our largest shareholder, he just told us he owes $90 million to the IRS. He never disclosed that before. Uh, we had to tell our bank. Our bank has fired us as the management team, except for this one board meeting. They're gonna pick apart the company and, and just sell it in pieces to their other customers. Uh, it was a billion revenue company. And we're gonna sell, they're gonna sell off each region um, and dissolve the company just so that they can make their money back. We owed them like 15 million, which was nothing really for a billion revenue company, but it was, you know, we, this was the rule. And uh, within days, my shares went from being worth millions to being worth zero. And I tried on the board, like on the call, how about I buy the pieces or how about I find buyers for each piece of the company or how about I raise money and we just pay back the bank. And they were like, everything I said, it was just too late. They've already locked us out of the offices. It's over. And, and now I get off the phone, and now uh, my favorite actor is filming this amazing scene. If I even told you the scene, you've seen the show and you've seen the scene. And, and, and my, the, my favorite director, he's directed like Limitless. He directed um, all these great movies. And 
and I just figured, you know what? I'm in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I just lost millions of dollars, but I'm on this. It's the first time I'm ever on the set of a TV show like this. I'm just going to enjoy the rest of the day. And so I spent the next eight hours asking questions to the directors, the writers, the actors. Uh, and a few months later, I explained to the, one of the writers what had happened that day. And they were like, oh my gosh, you were the last one to leave. You were uh, asking questions all day long and enjoying it. And uh, you know, I think it's really important. Like, I couldn't control anymore that situation. And I knew I wasn't going to sleep that night because I was going to be depressed and anxious. But I figured, OK, right now I'm here. And I'm never going to get this chance again. We only live one life. And I'm going to learn a lot. And I'm going to take what I learned into, into new things, new opportunities. And I decided to focus on that and not think about this negative thing until I, I made an appointment to think about it later with myself when I got home. And, and that's how I acted in the day. And I think you know, not wallowing in things you can't control is a very important part of um, you know, moving forward and making progress in life. Otherwise, you'll just be always held back by these, these negative events you can't control. And how do you use failure to hack the 10,000 hour rule? So for those of you that don't know, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers about 10,000 hours uh, required to, or this is just part of the book, 10,000 hours required to be really great at any skill. Um, and it, it does make you uh, a little kind of defeatist. It makes you think, you know, I have to be Mozart or Andre Agassi to get really good at uh, a certain skill. So how do you use failure to kind of short circuit that? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. So anytime you want to get good at something, I don't know how old uh, many of you are, but I'm 49, I'm going to be 50 in a month. And just as an example, over the past year, I've gotten somewhat obsessed with doing stand-up comedy. So I, I do stand-up comedy at, at different clubs uh, all around New York. I'm doing Chicago next week. I go up three to six times a week. And, um, and it's a scary thing. It's the scariest thing, and it's the hardest skill I've ever had to learn. And I've learned many different skills in my life uh, that are considered hard skills. And, and I talked to a lot of comedians, and they were all like, yeah, 20 years, 15 to 20 years. Is, if you watch a, a special on Netflix, chances are that comedian you're watching has been doing it for at least 15, probably more like 20 or 25 years. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, oh my gosh, I want to do this in a year. I don't want to do it in 20, I don't want to be doing this when I'm 70 years old. And it's so painful because you're, yeah, you're making people laugh, but before you go on, you're really nervous, and sometimes you bomb, and sometimes you get heckled, and sometimes you feel really awful afterwards. And there's so many sub-skills you need to learn. It's not just about telling a good joke. There's maybe 50 different sub-skills. And by way of comparison, I'd say becoming a chess master, maybe there's 20 different mutually exclusive sub-skills you have to learn and master to become an overall chess master. With comedy, I would say there's about 50 sub-skills. And so um, part of this is related to here I said to myself, well, I've been doing all these, po I've done 300 podcasts with amazing peak, peak performers, the best performers in the world at what they do. Again, again I'll mention Tony Hawk at skateboarding, or Gary Kasparov at chess, or uh, Astro Teller from Google has been on my podcast. Um, Sarah Blakely is probably the only self-made uh, female billionaire on the Forbes list who invented Spanx. She's been on my podcast. Arianna Huffington. Uh, so many great writers, actors, comedians, athletes, entrepreneurs. Richard Branson was just on. And so, but on the 10,000 hour rule specifically, I also had on Anders Ericsson, who Malcolm Gladwell, in his book Outliers, he's quoting Anders Ericsson on the 10,000 hour rule. So I wanted to know. So I invited Anders Ericsson on. Anders Ericsson broke it down. It's not quite 10,000 hours. That was just a catchy phrase that was used in the book. For some people, it was 10,000 hours. For others, it wasn't. Um, he said the Beatles, which was the example in the book, the Beatles uh, performed 24 hours a day at these German porn clubs before they were famous. Just, and that was how they got their 10,000 hours, was the example Gladwell used. Um, now, um, Anders Ericsson thought it was more like 4,000 hours when he calculated it out. So I figured, OK, it might not be 10,000 hours for everybody if you have some talent and so on, although Erickson doesn't believe in, in talent. And uh, uh, then I started asking everybody, what were common denominators in um, your 10,000 hours, in your, 
in your move towards world excellence. And there's a couple of ways that you can um, kind of hack the 10,000 hours. And an important one, I'll get to failure in a second, but an important one is building up a strong community of friends who are already successful in that subculture. So anything you want to get good at, let's say you want to get good at tennis, there's already a subculture. Like if you just show up at the professional tennis courts or whatever, nobody's going to talk to you because they don't know who you are and they're already friends with all the other pros. They don't want to talk with the weaker players. But if you can somehow figure out how to be friends with all the strong people in the space that you want to get good at, um, that's, you can literally skip five to eight years of work because they know everything you're doing wrong. They could just look at what you're doing and they say, this, 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 you're doing wrong. So as an example, I had a ping, like many people probably, I had a ping pong table in my basement when I was a kid. I played ping pong every day when I, the whole time I was growing up and I've played ping pong for 40 years. Then I took ping pong lessons a few months ago from a world class ping pong player, like he's world champion level. 100% of the things I was doing were wrong. So the way I held the racket, the way I swung, the way I did the backhand, the, the racket itself, uh, the way I stood, even the way I kept score <laughs> was wrong. I, di I didn't even know. I, I didn't even know the. I didn't even know the rules of ping pong. Uh, so, so, so just by taking a few lessons, I immediately was like much, much better than I was for 40 entire years. And so, that's the importance of being around. You're the. You know, they, there's that saying. You're the average of the five people around you. Well, if everybody around you is a chess grandmaster, you're going to much more easily be a chess grandmaster as opposed to just playing bad people all day. And you know that's true for everything in life. So that's, that's one fast way to hack a good, let's say it really is 10,000 hours, although I think it's less. That's a way to hack like at least four or 5,000 hours out of that 10,000 hours. Now, failure is extremely important. So let's say comedy, I go up on stage and one time I go up and I use the same exact joke and everybody laughs. The second time, I go up on stage and nobody laughs. In fact, I might even get heckled. And I have videos of both. I videotape all the times I go up on stage, or most of the times I go up on stage. So I'll, I'll take the videos and I'll show it to several comedians and I'll say, what is the difference between these two videos? I don't understand. I'm not seeing something. But they've been doing it 20 years, so they instantly see many, many things that I don't see. I'm completely blind. For me, I'm only asking, is the joke funny or not? For them, they're asking, how are you holding the microphone? How are you moving around the stage? What does your voice sound like? Are there more men than women in the audience? Are there more older people than younger people in the audience? Are there more Taurus or non-Taurus in the audience? Do you have a friend in the audience who happens to be the first one laughing? Um, there, there's so many things they're looking at that uh, they might say, you may seem, you may think you said the same joke, but it's actually a different joke in these various ways. You switch these two words. Or you took two sips of water instead of one sip of water in the middle of that joke. That was one response that was completely 100% the, the reason why the same joke was funny one time and not funny the other is that in the middle of the joke, I took two sips of water instead of one sip of water. And there was a reason or the timing created too much tension on the two sips of water versus the one sip of water. But it took a professional comedian to tell me that. Now, so, so again, failure allows you to ask, you know, you can say, oh, I failed at this, I'm gonna quit. And that's what most people do. Anything that's hard, anything that's worth doing is hard. Else everybody would be a success at everything. So everything worth doing is very, very difficult. So you're gonna fail in big ways, and you're going to fail in little ways every single day. Every single time I go on stage, I fail at something. And, um, and I'm just speaking specifically about comedy. I could be talking about chess. I could be talking about business. In business, there are so many sub-skills. Again, I would probably say there's about 30 different sub-skills that you have to master with each one to, be, to make money for yourself. Um, but I'll, I'll just stick to the comedy example for a second. Um, uh, you know, I had one case where, oh, but this is why it's important to be, ha, ha, the question is how do you get to get 
professional comedians uh, look at my little stupid videos, they don't want me to be better. They don't want an extra person saying he's a, he or she's a comedian. But I, because of my business expertise, I bought part of the comedy club and that I performed at the most. So now I get to talk to, and I have a podcast. So I could talk to any, almost any comedian I want to talk to, and right in the middle of my podcast, oh, this is part of the podcast. Look at these two videos of me doing comedy. Tell me where I went wrong. And <laughs> it's a great way to get feedback. And so I figured out how to hack getting professionals to look at these mini failures I do along the way and give me help. So most people wouldn't even guess what the most important skill is in comedy. You would think the obvious, which is humor. Now, by the way, humor itself is divided into a bunch of different sub-skills. Like how you write uh, a punchline is different than how you tell a funny story. Public, a funny story in public speaking doesn't work telling the same story in stand-up comedy. No one will laugh in comedy. Everyone will laugh in public speaking. So, uh, but the most important skill that many comedians have told me is not humor, but likability. And so that's why you see many comics who are unknown, they get on stage and they start talking to the audience, where are you from? Or they say, I grew up and I was bullied and here's the worst bullying. And then they try to make a joke at the end, but they're self-deprecating in the beginning so you, they, the audience can relate a little bit. Um, that's only one way to build likability. There's other ways to build likability and you're learning all those sub-skills. But like on business, I'll give you a very important set of sub-skills. So obviously product development is an important sub-skill in business. But most people think that's the only skill. Oh, if we build a good product, people will buy the product, VCs will invest in money. Most, but I, I've done uh, hundreds of angel investments at this point. I'll tell you an incredibly important skill that is different from any other skill in business, but I won't invest unless I see that the CEO and maybe the other investors have this skill. It's really hard to sell your company. So selling, a nobody wants to write you a check that will make you rich. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, today I'm gonna make Jesse rich. <laughs> nobody has ever woken up and said that in their lives. It's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> no one has said it about anybody. Um, so, so, so having the ability to convince somebody else, like of course there, it, it, selling a company is not about making somebody rich, but the reality is it is. And so you have, so there's all sorts of ways you have to have this skill to convince people to buy your company. And that's a 100% different skill than raising money, than selling the product, than managing employees, than sales, than negotiations, than building a product. All of these skills are important. Dealing with a landlord is almost as an important skill as developing a product uh, for various reasons that most people wouldn't suspect. For instance, if Google bought a company and I had a landlord, my landlord has to approve that Google's the new tenant instead of me. And if the landlord says no, you can't sell your company. So there's all these little things that most people don't think about when they start a company. And I've seen so many, it's been the cause of so many failures of mine, investing in the wrong set of skills. Uh, and now I, I, ha I have one trick for it, which is I only invest in alongside people smarter than me. So I outsource my thinking to people who have big research teams doing due diligence, and ideally the CEO has built and sold the company before, so I know he's got the whole skill set, and, and so on. So, but these are some ways in which failure has taught me. And I'll just give you one quote from, so Ray Dalio was on my podcast last week. We haven't released the podcast yet, but um, he is the, uh, founder and, and still runs the largest hedge fund in the world. He's worth about, you know, he's worth tens of billions. Uh, he, he said in the podcast, pain plus reflection equals progress. And that's a very valuable quote relating to all, all you know, how you hack these, these 10,000 hours. Yeah. I want to get to Q&A in, in a second, but real quick, I want to couple two questions sure. together. Sure. Oh, I promise I'll answer more questions. <laughs> no, you're all good. Um, so the two questions are, uh, what's your favorite podcast you've ever done and why? And then the second question is, what's your favorite life hack? Uh, or to put it a different way, what's the one thing these people can do that will have the greatest kind of multiplicative effect, positive effect on their, on their life, whether it's sleep or whatever? So, sure. So 
Uh, the, the, the greatest, the best podcast I've ever done, it's really hard to answer because I, I learned so much from all of these amazing people. Like, I don't know how many people grew up on Judy Bloom books, for instance. Like, I grew up reading, Judy Bloom was the best children's writer in the 1970s. She sold 150 million copies of her books. And I would never have imagined when I was in fifth grade or sixth grade that one day I was going to talk to Judy Bloom. Like, that was an amazing moment for me. I know it doesn't sound like the most amazing thing, but usually the best podcast I've ever had is my last podcast, because that's the one that's still so fresh in my memory, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking about the things they say. So again, Ray Dalio was the, the, the last one I did. But I'll, I'll talk about the worst podcast I ever did <laughs> yeah. and what I learned from it. So uh, <laughs> this was in 2014 I did this podcast with um, the, the rapper Biz Marquis. Yeah. Do you know Biz Marquis? He did that song, Just a Friend. It's kind of like a popular song. And I said to him, uh, what's it like that everybody knows you primarily? You've done a lot of songs and albums and things in your life, but everybody primarily knows you from Just a Friend. And he was very upset. He said, I've done much more than Just a Friend. And I said, that's true. But two things I want to point out. One, if I go to your website, the, the song immediately starts playing, just for friends. <laughs> and if I, if, and if I were to go to China right now and ask anybody, do you know who Biz Marquis is? If they know you at all, they're gonna sing Just a Friend. So he's like, yeah, but I did Gaba 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 on Nickelodeon, I did this song, that song, and he hung up on me. And um, <laughs> so it's the only time of something I ever hung up on me on a podcast. And so, so I figured, okay, well, it's not so fun to just put this podcast up. So what I did was I put, I, I, I had the audio engineer play the podcast and then with another person, we analyzed what I did wrong throughout this podcast. So we kept having the engineer rewind, fast forward, rewind, fast forward, and we kept commenting how I could have done a better job on this podcast. So, so I made it like a meta podcast about doing this bad podcast. So every, everything is content. Every, everything, you know, process is art. Just as much as the outcome, the process of, of the final outcome is artistic in and of itself. You know, I, I, we had scheduled at one point for the podcast Jordan Belfort, who's the, you know, he's famous for the, being the wolf of, the, of Wall Street. He's a, a criminal. He went and spent time in jail. He's not, he's, he did his time, so I shouldn't say he's a criminal, but he, he spent time in jail. Leonardo DiCaprio plays him in the movie. But before the podcast, he asked, it's the only time I was ever asked this, he asked his publicity team, I shouldn't say he, his publicity team said, you need to submit all the questions in advance. And I said, no, that's, that's like Soviet Russia did that. Like, I'm not doing that. And I'm going to ask him whatever I want to ask him. And, and listen to my podcast. I'm never mean to anybody on my podcast. It's not like I'm trying to trap somebody. So it shows me they didn't do their work on my podcast. And... And I didn't want to, and anyway, it wasn't like he was a peak performer. The guy was a criminal, so he didn't want to, I didn't want to have him on my podcast. It, again, he did his time, not a criminal. <laughs> I, have to say, I have to say that legally. But, um, but, so was that a failure or a success? Well, I wrote an article mentioning that. I turned process into content. It was an article that appeared on 20 different platforms, got tens of thousands of views. And I don't think he's a bad guy. It could have just been his publicity team. I have no idea. But, but everything I do that doesn't work out, I always figure out how do I take this process and turn it into art in some other way, or turn it into a business, or turn it into an opportunity, or turn it into an idea for somebody else. So I always repeat that to myself every day, process is art, because whatever we do, however we falter, even if I completely fail, for instance, at comedy, the process of failing, like I've written about bombing, and just the process of how you deal with that becomes art, becomes, and for me, art, I write for, for so many different things and for so many different reasons, you know, it becomes connected to all my other businesses and my all, you know, so now, not only, not only am I writing about bombing and comedy, but for one group of my readers, I'm writing about failure. Another group of readers, I'm writing about, here's the meta language of how to learn anything and part of the process of me learning something that's a hard skill. It doesn't matter what the skill is. So there's so many different levels when you treat process as art. There's so many different ways you can, you can use that to create new works of art that have nothing to do with how you started. So that's incredibly valuable. 
So I think that was the answer to what's my favorite podcast. Yeah. So I took that Bismarck Key experience and I made art out of it in a different way than, was, than I had initially expected. And then your second question was? Life hack, favorite one. Okay. I, and this happened to me even yesterday. Uh, uh, somebody comes up to me and says, I read that 10, I, your, your suggestion of doing 10 ideas a day. I thought it was nothing. You know, the best life hacks are not like, oh, inject this super soldier serum into your arm <laughs> and you're gonna become Captain America. Like, the best life hacks are simple ones that people don't realize the compound effect of it over time becomes a miracle. And so writing 10 ideas a day improves your idea muscle and strengthens your idea muscle 1% a day. 1% a day compounded is 3,800% a year. Billions of percent over 10 years. So you're gonna be like, your ability to compete against everyone else becomes so powerful over time, even over the course of a year, even the, over the course of three months. If you just write 10 ideas a day, and someone came up to me and told me this yesterday. He said, I, I didn't think this would be anything. I figured I'll try it for a couple of weeks. And he said it was like magic what happened. <laughs> it'll create so many opportunities. It'll create so many, whether it's businesses or skills or relationships, or if you want to meet your future wife or husband, it's, this one thing, and I'm not, I'm not even advising people to do it. This is what it's done for me. And it's, it's in, it's, the, the results of that have been incredible. And then number two, of course, is um, uh, making sure no toxic people are in your life. You cannot, you cannot cure a toxic person. You can only remove yourself from their presence. And so be around people you love and who love you. I know it sounds corny or cliche, but the, the, you know, I even described it in a simple way as a hack you know, to, to take you know, between four and 8,000 hours out of the 10,000 hour rule. It's so incredibly important. Uh, uh, you know, those two things alone are, are, if you just do that, your life's gonna change almost overnight. And you know, we keep toxic people in our lives all the time. We think, oh, I have to deal with this person because they're my cousin or they're my neighbor or they're my friend since, since high school. Well, let me tell you something that's important about that. The guy who lives in another town who you never see, that's never the toxic person in your life. It's always the people close to you that you think you can't get away from that are the toxic people in your life. And that's the hard thing for people to realize. Oh no, that's my, my grandma, I can't avoid her. Well, I'm sorry, that's, you can't have, to you only live one life. Are you gonna spend a, a big percentage of it with somebody who's gonna ruin your life? Anyway, that's, I don't want to end on a negative note though. Uh, uh, so I will say that 10 ideas a day and being around people you, you, you love and who love you, that hacks really the 10,000 hour rule because that allows you to take failure and just fling yourself onto your idea machine and onto these people who love you and they are the safety net that will bounce you back up. Awesome, do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Um, you alluded to family, and uh, I was just wondering, in these tumultuous ups and downs, how that affected your children, uh, or how did you protect them, or was that part of, did you want them to be part of that? And then, um, yeah, that's just... Okay, great question. So the question is, um, when I was having these ups and downs, and they happened maybe four or five times, let's say three where I went completely broke to the point where I lost a home, had tax issues, you know, was really depressed and suicidal, um, and then there were other times kind of in between. And uh, how did this affect my family, particularly my children? So I had two daughters, and now they're older. Um, I suppose ultimately um, they would know better than me how it affected them, but I tried very hard to um, be positive around them and not let them see how things were affecting me and try to put things in the best possible light. I suppose that, to some extent, having two daughters, for me personally, uh, inspired me in a couple ways to, to keep going for their sake and to show them that this is as an, you can't, you can't teach by telling somebody do this. You can only teach by example. And I hope, I don't know what the final result will be, they're 18 and 15 now, but I hope that by example through all these years, 
they turn out to be, and so far so good, they turn out to be good adults. But I always try to buffer them from everything. I'm sure it worked to some extent. It didn't work for others. Maybe in some ways they're more anxious about things than I, than I realize. But again, time will tell. I, I did think of it, though, and being aware of it is, is the first solution. And just doing the best you can is, after that is important. But I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't like shake them and say, you're two years old. We're going broke. <laughs> I, I would never do anything like that. I did get, for better or for worse, I, their mother and I did get divorced, though. I don't know if it was related to all my failures, but I certainly wouldn't want to be married to me at that point. So, Any other questions? Yeah. Um, Hold on one sec. Uh, in 2018, what's uh, your thoughts on going to college? 2018, what's my thoughts are going to, on going to college? The same as my thoughts in 2005. So in 2005, I was a columnist for the Financial Times, and um, I wrote this article, why nobody should ever go to college again. And at the time, I was the only person saying it. Um, and there was lots of people trashing me on different blogs. I actually lost some good friendships over this. And um, now I think it's a more viable discussion. Right? I think people can't have this discussion without being slaughtered by everybody else. But um, the way I see it is, in college, so many, you know, tuitions have gone up faster than inflation every single year since 1977. But every single year. There hasn't been one year where inflation went up higher than tuitions. And in part, that's because the government backs, you know, will lend you money against your tuition, and it's the one kind of loan you, you can't get rid of in a bankruptcy. So of course, let's give it to every 18-year-old who's totally unqualified to borrow this money. So you create this skewed, you know, there's already this problem in, in society where, you know, rich people get certain benefits. And I don't mean to sound, this is not a political bias, this is the truth. Rich people have certain benefits and poor people don't. And, there's a di and that divide gets greater and greater. And that's why we have all this political strife right now. More than ever before, we have all these, pol these political enemies. Like half of Facebook hates the other half of Facebook and vice versa because of these political problems. And uh, I think in, in part it's created by some kids go to Harvard and, they, and they could, their parents can pay for it. And other kids borrow $200,000 to go to a, a worse school. And meanwhile, there's plenty of places online to learn faster and better. You can, there's so many online educational resources to learn more than you would have learned in college that I don't understand why 100% why of kids don't just learn for free better and start making money and don't go into debt. It seems to me like a no-brainer just thinking about it. Now, I have an 18-year-old, and so she was a senior last year, which foreshadowing. And I, had, I, I kept saying to her for, throughout her whole high school, we need to have this conversation. You're not going to college. And she would just, which wasn't really a conversation, right? It's like a command. And she would literally just turn around and start walking away. And I would say, don't walk away from me. It's like the only time I ever got angry about her was like on, on the topic of college. So I'm like, don't walk away from me. We're in the middle of a, a mall. I want to argue with you in front of all these people. And because uh, and, that's the only time we spent time together was when she was, I would take her shopping. And uh, you know, but I realized, I realized several things. One is, you know, A, I wasn't being a very good father if she didn't feel comfortable having a very basic conversation with me. So again, I, I had to. To, to parent by example and show open-mindedness and listen to what she wanted to do with her life and offer her real alternatives. I even wrote a book, Bought 40 Alternatives to College, and I self-published it, and she did not read the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but So one time I said to her, look, what do you want to be? And she, I know she's going to see this on a video, but she lied to me, I suspect, and she said, oh, I want to be a neurobiologist. And I'm like, you have never once spoken to me about anything relating to neuro or biology or any Aji 
or any ner. <laughs> you're just not interested in this. You want to, you're interested in chemistry, are you interested in statistics, are you interested in all these sub things you're going to have to learn. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I'm interested. And so I would buy her neurobiology books. Did you read it? Never read it. So, um, but I knew she, since she was in kindergarten, she's been in every single performance in her school ever. Like, so I'm like, you want to be an actor. Why don't you, why don't you act? And uh, I'm like, well, you have to go to college to go major in acting. I'm like, no, you don't. The first skill in acting is learning how to audition. So here's what we're going to do. This is what I offered her. I am going to give you in cash, like a brick of cash, the tuition I would have paid to that school you're going to. Um, the president of that school just agreed to go on the podcast, so I shouldn't make fun of it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and all you have to do is watch a movie with me every morning. We'll pick a different movie every day. You just have to watch one movie with me every morning, and then spend the rest of the day going on auditions. Because you'll learn how to, you'll learn A, if you like the lifestyle, B, you'll learn if, how to get better at auditions when you're 18 instead of when you're 23. Um, C, you won't have any kind of debt or, you know, you would have saved, I would have saved an enormous amount of money. Uh, uh, and you'll just be that much ahead of all your peers. You'll learn so much more about acting. Actually, being in New York, I happen to have had, like, Broadway producers and other producers on my podcast. It's one call for me to get you auditions. That's the real advantage you have. And might as well take advantage of it. And she said no. Uh, instead, she decided to go to college, which she's enjoying very much. And so I'm um, against it. And she's an adult. And I figured, OK, I still want to. I don't, I don't know if I did the right thing or the wrong thing, but I wanted to be supportive of her. Now she's deciding what to major in. At least major in acting so you learn a real skill that you're interested in and not learn some something like neurobiology, which I know you're not interested. It's not, it's not like being a neuroscientist is a fallback profession. <laughs> you know, just learn an actual skill that's very hard to learn, acting, and then you could see if you want to be an actor and come to New York. Now people will say, well, what if, uh, you know, what if, what's she going to do later <laughs> on if it doesn't work out as acting? Does anyone here, act, well, this is a different sort of place, but most people I know don't actually do what they learned in college. I, I was a computer science major. I went to grad school in computer science. And then my first real job doing computer programming, I was so bad at programming, I had to go to remedial programming classes for two months just to be at the lowest level of my job at programming. Now, I went to an Ivy League undergraduate school for computer science, and I went to a top two or three graduate school for computer science. Again, many employees at here went to the same graduate school. I know, I, they were in my class. And uh, it didn't help me. Only the real world helps you. So that's my two cents on 2018. There you go. Anybody Please, else? No. Don't go to college. <laughs> uh, let's pass the mic over there, if possible. Um, what's your biggest insight on uh, relationship and dating that most people don't realize? Biggest insight on relationship and dating that most people don't realize. And to qualify, I am really not an expert. But I will tell you a couple things I've learned through failure, and then a couple <laughs> things I'm trying to guess uh, as I go along. First off, you, I don't know if you remember this book, The Rules. It was written in the 90s, sold 3 million copies. Um, great book uh, these two women wrote about dating. They were on my podcast recently. And I'm not going to discuss their book. but. Um, they gave me advice. And their advice to me was, do online dating. And I said, no, I'm never going to do online dating. And they said, why not? And I said, you know, everything is related to supply and demand. The value of how you, of how you look at something is always related to supply and demand. I sort of feel, for me, personally, that online dating creates this illusion of infinite supply. So it reduces the value for me of a relationship, a long-term relationship. Now, short-term, who knows? That's not what I go for. I go for a long-term. And for me, I feel like having just the feeling of infinite supply will, oh, I don't, this person doesn't like Chinese food, swipe but on to the next one. So <laughs> it reduces this, this value I place on really getting to know somebody. So I prefer. Uh, uh, 
I, I prefer meeting somebody through friends or you know through some sort of interactions. But um, uh, the other thing that's really important is to, it's okay for people. You have to have anger compatibility with who you go out with. If if you you ever have that relationship where you're arguing over here and they're arguing over here, and somehow you're like, trying to, what, what, I don't understand what you're saying. You just said this, but now you're saying, like you don't, you're not compatible in the way you're arguing. There's something completely, some line of communication completely off. Now many people will say, well that happens in every relationship. But I've seen plenty of relationships where that never happens. And they, they argue, and maybe they argue for a serious argument, but somehow they resolve it. So I think anger compatibility is, is important. The other thing, um, the other thing I will say is uh, it's one thing when two people are able to support each other through hard times. If, if you're in a relationship with somebody and they get sick, you're, you help them through hard times. Or they, they fail in business, which happens to me regularly, you help me through hard times. And, um, but that is not the important thing to note. The important thing to really ask is, does this other person help me through successful times? So let's say you were dating somebody who, I'll just use the actress example. Oh, they say to you, uh, I just got an acting gig. I'm going to co-star in Ocean's 18 with Brad Pitt. And I've got to ki kiss Brad Pitt in the middle of the movie. Now, if you, I think a really good thing is to be supportive of them achieving their dreams. You know and they will in turn will be supportive of you and that's a sign of an extremely healthy relationship that will last forever. And there's even studies that show that that's the type of relationship that will last forever. Even more so than the people who help each other during hard times, it's the people who support each other during successful times. So I think, I think that's really important. And then finally, I will quote a good friend of mine. Um, I've had both him and his wife on my podcast. Uh, uh, Basically, he said to me, the most important decision you'll ever make for your career is who you decide to spend the rest of your life with. And I really do agree with that. Who is that person? Uh, so it's Brian Koppelman, who created the, he wrote Rounders, Oceans 13, speaking of oceans. He wrote uh, one of my favorite movies, A Solitary Man. He writes the TV show Billions. And his wife's Amy Koppelman. She's written three excellent novels, uh, plus the movie I Smile Back, starring Sarah Silverman. And they have a really, they've been together forever. They really, uh, they, they, uh, and he was the one, we were giving a talk at a, I was interviewing him at another company, and uh, uh, he said this to me, uh, either in the talk or maybe when we were on the plane, I forget. But I remember it, though. Do you want to take the final question? Yeah, cool. I'd love to. So um, I'm super curious about this, and I just felt like I had to ask. So I was gonna, first of all, I was gonna ask you like, what were you most proud of? And then I was like, no, I'm, I'm more curious about this. And I'm more I'll curious. Real quick, I'm most proud of speaking here at Google. Awesome. <laughs> honestly, honestly, Google, oh my gosh. I'm speaking in front, thank you so much. I'm speaking in front of the best company in the world. And, and, and just to add to that, Google is such a great, I, I'm gonna interrupt your asking your question. No problem, please. Uh, is that okay on time? Or, That's totally fine. So, so Google, there's one aspect of Google that is such an important lesson in life. When you go to Google, Google is this one page website, right? When you, the search engine I'm talking about, google.com. You go to Google and Google has nothing on it. There is nothing, there's nothing there. It's, if, if you wanna, but what you do is you type in, oh, I want to learn about motorcycles. And Google will, as fast as possible, it'll literally say to you, I don't know anything about motorcycles, but we've determined for you, here's our 10 favorite sites and 400 million more if you want, but here's our 10 favorite sites about motorcycles. Why don't you go to one of them? And so they get you off of, they measure success by how, you guys measure success by how fast the customer leaves the website. So, now, if you want to find out about, I don't know, tennis, uh, where do you go? Well, I remember that other site, Google.com, was so good at helping me find out about motorcycles, I'm going to go back to Google to find out about tennis. So what's the life lesson? If you're the source and you're willing to just, hey, you don't have to give me any money, you don't owe me anything, you never even have to come back here, maybe this is the last time you and I meet, 
but I'm going to still give you my all and send you to the best resources, who are you going to go back to? You're going to go back to the source, which is Google. That's such a give credit wherever you can, give ideas wherever you can. Always be the source. Be the, be the bank of knowledge and information and giving, and then everybody comes back to you again and again. And that's, and that's the goal. That's why I'm so proud to speak here. What's your question? Woo, awesome, <laughs> that, was, that was really nice. <laughs> uh, my question, and, and what I'm most curious about, is what is, what is the story behind your hair? Like, honestly, no lie, the first, the first article I ever read by you, I, I was just like, wow, this person, he looks very interesting. And, and, a little funny looking, like maybe I'll read I his article and see looking. how it is. So um, I'm just always been curious. Hair or Brian <laughs> Razor's hair. So, so I've <laughs> always been curious because <laughs> it, it, it makes you stand out for sure. When I worked in a cubicle, I kept it and wore a suit. Or go went on TV. I used to go on CNBC a lot. I kept it short. Now I work from home most of the time, and I don't really bathe that much. <laughs> and uh, I just go a little wild. So I had to do, you know. Most of the activities I do don't really require me to, I don't know, I'm not dressed up or anything. I, I, I have only a few outfits to my name. You know, for a long time, I only had, I would never have more than 15 possessions to my name. And uh, I, I, can, I didn't really consider myself a minimalist. I just didn't want to own anything. I didn't want to think about anything. So I didn't want to think about anything except the things I loved. And it's just part of that, I just, um, you know, I just live the life I wanna. I wanna live, and, and nothing. I don't. I don't need extra frills. So, I don't know. Anything you want to plug before we go? No, I'm just happy. I'm really super excited you invited me to be here. I'll I'll promote your your dad's two books. Can I do that? <laughs> sure. The Tools is a great book. Uh, I I honest to be honest, I read the second book, but I forget the title. I have a really bad. Coming alive. Coming alive. Yeah. Great book. Uh, I think we were planning on having him on the podcast at some point. It's great books. I really enjoyed the. I really enjoyed both. But I, I will. Can I say one more thing about memory? Yeah. And this is related to Google too. Yeah. So um, I'm always constantly worried because I'm preparing so much for podcasts and for other things. I really forget a lot of things. I'll even be like out on a date and I'll forget the name of the woman, <laughs> even if I've been dating her for months. <laughs> so, uh, which so so one time I signed up for 23 and Me. Um, which is, you know, indirectly, I think Google is an investor or Google Ventures is, or I don't know, there's some connection there. And um, I, I had the gene, I did the test, uh, the DNA test, and I had the gene, oh, there's a little bit extra chance you could have early onset Alzheimer's, which is a BS statistic. If you have a 0.001%, 20% more chance doesn't really mean anything. It's, not, it's how they always, doctors always scare people. But, uh, so I wrote to the CEO at the time, and I said, oh, there's all these, I did some research, there's all these foods you can eat to delay the onset of Alzheimer's. How about I write the, um, the AP40E, which is like the gene, how about I write the AP40E cookbook? And, uh, you know, recommending all these, you know, Alzheimer's foods. And she wrote back instantly, that book would be a bestseller, you know why? And I wrote back, why? And she said, uh, because no one would remember if they had already bought it. <laughs> so I give, I give credit to her. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Th thank James. you really for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.